I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to our talk this afternoon. My name is Mark. I'm a member of the faculty here. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, Games Society and the uh, professor for the course, Brian Sullivan, for allowing us to come in here and give this great talk. Um, also, we're taking some pictures as part of some of the archive stuff with the Center of the Arts. If you're uncomfortable having your picture taken, just go ahead and raise your hand, and uh, we'll make sure to avoid you. Um, so, let me give you a little introduction to our speaker today. Seth graduated from Northeastern here in 2007 with a bachelor's in mechanical engineering after doing three co-ops, two at MIT Lincoln Labs and one at Gillette. He then went on to the uh, Entertainment Technology Center at Carnegie Mellon, where one of his projects there was called Winds of Orbis. It was an international games festival student finalist, so he got to go to GDC, it was a great time. Then in 2009, he went to a Cambridge-based startup called Conduit Labs, which later got bought by Zynga, and he became the lead game designer of Indiana Jones Adventure World, which he's going to talk about today. All right, so uh, let's give a welcome to our speaker today, Seth Seba. Hey guys, thank you, uh, thank you very much for, for having me here and for coming out on the on the beautiful beautiful fall day here in Boston. Um, I really appreciate it. So the talk I'm going to be going through with you guys today is one that I gave at GDC this year, um, and it covers it's basically a story about Indiana Jones Adventure World, and it's based, it's a little bit of a postmortem on on what we did to create the first map in that game and all the lessons that I personally learned and my team learned from the process of going through that. Um, one of the things that I kind of wanted to start with, sort of uh, the elephant in the room, as it were, for anyone that, that's um, been paying attention to kind of games press recently, how many people want to get into the games industry in this, in this audience? Probably most of you, right? So Zynga laid off and closed the Boston studio and the entire, laid off the entire staff three weeks ago. Um, as part of the game industry, it's a it's a tough place. It's a um, it's a real challenge to to thrive in the industry, and it gets tougher every day. But the the sort of silver lining is that it's becoming easier and easier for small groups and small studios to to cut their way uh, into the industry by producing games on mobile and games on Steam and things like that. And so the outlook looks good for you guys um, as you continue to move forward. But just keep that in mind that this is a tough and competitive place. So. It's uh, it's this should be a it was a very cold lesson for me to learn. This was sort of my first studio closure I'd gone through. There were a couple of people at my uh, at Zynga Boston that had been through six of them before. So to tell you that this happens frequently, I would not be joking. Um, and the reality is is that this is this is a constant churn inside the industry. Much like most entertainment, um, this stuff is is constantly rolling, and you have to be ready for that. Um, but I wouldn't. I don't have any regrets from my time at Zynga, and I don't have any regrets working on this game or with those people because they were great. Um, but I just wanted to get that out of the way so there weren't any questions. So I am the excellent designer, and Zynga Boston is no more. So um, just, to, just to cover that for you guys. So now what is this talk really about? So this is a story about Indiana Jones Adventure World. This is a game that was released in September of last year, uh, in 2011. Um, and, and I'm basically going to go through the who, what, why and how um, that we made that game and, and cover some of the things that we learned along the way. Um, so Mark went into this a little bit, but like, who am I? Um, so I went to Carnegie Mellon, like he said. Uh, I joined Conduit Labs as an engineer. Um, for anyone trying to get into the games industry, uh, it's really valuable to have a, like, um, intro level game design uh, jobs are few and far between. So if you have, a, uh, if you have another skill, whether it be art or um, you know, writing or level design or anything like that. Straight game design is a tough place to start. Um, I started as a technical designer, so I did, you know, basically game prototyping um, at Conduit Labs, and then we were later bought by Zynga in August of 2010, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on, like what the, what the sort of outlook of the industry looked like in 2010. Um, so that's who I am. So now, who's the Boston design team? So the design team at Zynga Boston was big. We had six designers, um, uh, six content designers, along with a full-time writer and two systems designers. Um, and so the uh, Boston studio is made up of a lot of people that have worked on some big MMOs um, and a lot of online uh, and multiplayer games. And that was something that we, that we used as a core strength in kind of driving forward what we did on Adventure World. Um, some of these are probably really recognizable. Some of them you're probably like, I've never heard of that game before, and that's totally fine. So now, who is the audience? So 
one of Zynga's core values is, is to try and make games for everyone. The idea is that you, the goal that Mark Hankus set out was to get a billion people playing games together. Um, that's a lot of people. And so when we look at this audience and, and who exactly we're trying to go after for, for Adventure World, we, tried to, we basically looked at everyone. We wanted young people, we wanted young adults, we wanted adults, we wanted sort of middle-aged people, and we even wanted you know, grandparents. And in the mix of all of this, one group that we were really curious to see if we could actually um, get interested in the game were gamers. It took me so long to find this picture of a, of a gamer, by the way. It uh, turns out we are not a photogenic bunch in general. Um, but we wanted to, we wanted to bring, um, we wanted to bring uh, Adventure World to as many people as possible without excluding any specific group. And so we tried to do whatever we could to, to um, make the game approachable for everyone. And this was, this sort of goes through a lot of our core challenges and a lot of things I'll talk about that we learned from, from basically trying to make games for people that are not us. So that's the who. So now let's take a look at the what. Um, I don't know how many of you guys have actually played this game. Uh, it's it's um, still available online now on Facebook. Um, but I'll show you guys just, uh, hopefully this will work. This is the trailer for when, um, so we didn't launch with Indiana Jones. We sort of added Indiana Jones about a month or so, a month and a half after our initial launch. Um, and so this was the trailer for when we actually put Indiana Jones in the game. And we'll give you a good idea of what the game looks like and, and how it plays. If adventure has a name, then it must be Indiana Jones. Zynga proudly presents Indiana Jones Adventure World. That's right. Team up with the one and only Indiana Jones on his latest quest to keep safe the secrets of the ancient world. So what are you waiting for? Grab your whip. Join your friends and hold on to your hat. Indies his name, adventures his game. Play Indiana Jones Adventure World today. We were very, very proud of that Indies his name, adventures his game. I was standing there when our art director came up with that, and I, I don't think he'll ever let us forget it. He was so happy with that. Um, so that's, that gives you a kind of a rough overview of what the game looked like and, and some of the gameplay that we had. And, and what this game really was at its core is we, we tried to make an episodic casual adventure game. And that, that sounds like a lot of jargon, but I'll get more specific as to what exactly that means. Um, we wanted to make it so that you would complete quests and explore um, on map gameplay. This was really important to us, the idea that you would be basically playing levels um, as like a more traditional <coughs> game. You would be going through different areas and you would be experiencing new content all the time. That's one of the big secrets about what makes Zynga games work is the fact that People play these games because they're releasing new content all the time. It's like a TV show. Zynga games release almost sometimes more than twice a week with new content. And that's why people continue to play them forever and ever. Um, this was one of our, this is a, a map that took place inside the volcano. So one of the artifacts to collect, this was a jaguar idol. And so you'd have to sort of navigate a bunch of puzzles and climb up this set of stairs to recover this idol. And that was one of the, one of the kind of core pieces of gameplay we had in the game. Another thing that we really wanted to do is, is give people an opportunity to travel the world. One of the things that, that you should be thinking about when you're trying to make your game is figuring out what, what aspirations can you, can you bring to the player. And one of these, everyone likes to travel. They love the idea of seeing the world. Um, and that was one of the things we wanted to do. This was, um, we started in, in, in sort of Mesoamerica and kind of um, in the jungles, and we ended up going to Egypt. If anyone's seen a lot of Indiana Jones movies, he goes to Egypt all the time. Uh, and so we, we thought it was really important to to end up going to Egypt at some point. And this was one of the one of the sets of maps that we did. There's nine maps in this storyline um, that cover sort of the intro to Egypt. Another thing that we wanted to do was bring this idea of, of a light RPG to these gamers. And we did that by trying to give you upgradable tools and gadgets. So this was, hey, you can customize your character by choosing what tools you want to specialize in. You won't be able to specialize in them all um, because that's going to take a lot of resources, but you can pick and choose which ones you want to focus on. So, if you say, really like to clear rocks instead of clearing bushes, you can go after a pickaxe instead of the machete. And then the last thing is to sort of build up your base camp, and, and that's a place where you kind of hold your supplies and treasure. It's sort of your anchor in this whole game. Um, I'll talk about this a little bit more, but this was one of the game, one of the, one of the parts of the game that, that did not end up as great as it could have been. Um, and I've sort of talked about this at length before, is the fact that this, this particular aspect was not as polished as we could have made. So what is the gameplay um, for Adventure World, and what makes it different? 
we started with quests, and this was not new, um, in, especially not in social games. This is something that's been in there since Frontierville was kind of the first one to, to really bring this into, into social games. Um, we had energy management. So this was the core of the game. The core of the game was around navigating these areas, so you would try to get your player to something like this ruby base. And what you do is decide which path had the least amount of energy. So you'd spend energy by either clearing these bushes, but watch out for the snake, clearing this bush and disarming this trap and going and, and getting the base. Or if you went through the trap, you would get stuck and have to clear it with more energy to eventually get to the treasure you wanted. This was the core gameplay. The idea was trying to balance and figure out what was the best path through this um, in the least amount of energy. So that was also not new. Energy management was pretty common in, in social games, and, and it was something that we wanted to sort of take to the next level in Adventure World. So some of the new stuff we added. Combat. We were absolutely terrified of putting this in for a long time. We were really scared. And I'll talk about this when we get into the more details on the specific map, but the idea of having someone take damage in a social game, we were like, this is never going to work. We're going to hate it. We're going to lose all our players. Um, it ended up being fine, but it was something that we took a long time for us to figure out, and it took a lot of work for us to try. Another one that we added was puzzles, and specifically puzzles that you could potentially um, do over and over again and not be able to find the answer. Um, so in this particular puzzle, you could you would hit this switch, and these would play in a certain order, and you would solve that to get to the um, to the skull. And that was one of the things we wanted to add in. Puzzle games, especially sort of puzzly adventure games, were not really um, available yet on on Facebook, and that was something that we wanted to go after. And the very last thing was just exploration. We wanted to make a deep world that people wanted to explore and find, and so we hid little things all over the place. So this particular one was a gold necklace, and it was just part of a collection you could find. So that's sort of the what. That kind of covers what exactly this game had and what, what made it different. Um, so let's talk about the why a little bit. So when we thought about the game we wanted to make um, right after we were acquired by Zynga, we talked about a, you know what were some of the interesting ideas um, that would differentiate us from the games that were currently available. One of the things was we wanted to go on a journey. We wanted to leave the farm. Farmville at the time was, of course, the biggest game on Facebook, and we wanted to try and do something different, so we looked for ways to do that. One of these was we wanted to take the player on a journey. Another one was to tell a story. So Frontierville had just come out, and they were doing this awesome stuff with the storytelling, and we were like, hey, we want, to, we want to do that as well, and we want to make that more episodic. We want to make that into something that we're releasing every week, like a comic book. Um, that players could just play through and, and enjoy, just like they were watching their favorite TV show, like an like a episode of Lost. Another thing we wanted to do was evolve the gameplay. One of the promises we wanted to make to the players early on was, hey, if you continue to play our game for six months or nine months, it'll change over time. We'll add new stuff. We'll add new tools. We'll add new enemies. We'll add new puzzles. And you'll experience new things all the time. It won't be just constantly getting, you know, um, planting the same crops or building the same cities, it'll be something new. And so the Facebook ecosystem in 2010 was sort of made up of two games that we really looked at a lot. One of them was Treasure Isle. So Treasure Isle was all about going onto islands and digging for treasure. You had a little bit of like this minesweeper type gameplay um, as you tried to clear to find the treasures. And then the other one was Frontierville. And so what we did is we sort of looked at these two and when we pitched Zynga initially on the idea, we came up with the idea of Quest. So this is the initial like movie poster we used to pitch the game. Um, there were rumors about people seeing that and being like, sold, go make it. So we can thank our art director, I think, for a lot of that. But, um, but this was sort of where we, where we initially ended up. This is what, we, this is what we started, the game started out as. And so it was kind of a, um, an attempt to put together Frontierville type storytelling and energy-based gameplay with the sort of idea of going on an adventure from Treasure Island. So when we started to really get into this, we said, hey, what are games that we love? Um, and for me, personally, Ocarina of Time is my favorite game. So I looked a lot at that. I see some people uh, cheering as well. That's good. Um, uh, Tomb Raider was another game we really looked at. This is sort of kind of the, one of the best games for action adventure. And then other games that were just straight adventure. So looking at things like Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis. This is a really, <coughs> really great game. It has really great storytelling um, and some awesome parts. So we were like, hey, how can we, how can we use these games to kind of inspire us, to drive us to, to go after something interesting here? One of the things we came up with, one of the things we realized really early on was that these games are really hard. This is a breakdown of the Water Temple from Ocarina of Time. This is a map of it. Don't worry, you're not supposed to be able to read it. There's a, there's a whole bunch of these online that sort of walk through how to do that. That's really, really complicated. 
Now remember that we're trying to make this game accessible for everyone. Um, that type of thing just won't work. When you're looking at something like this, this is just not easy. Trying to solve these push block puzzles in, in full 3D where you have jumping and skill, that was something that we, we knew we just couldn't do. We ended up getting push block puzzles into Adventure World, um, and they became some of the best stuff that we did, but we had to greatly simplify them. So what exactly did we do about that? Is we said, hey, how can we make these games for everyone? Let's take games that you're making uh, for this controller and try to figure out a way to get around that. So we don't have this when we're making social games. This is not an option. We just have this. And when you're dealing with games like Flash games, you really, you just get one button, that's it. So you really have that. And now how can you make, how can you bring gameplay, like what you see in Tomb Raider, like what you see in Ocarina of Time, and how can you bring that to, to a game and only let people interact with it with one button? So this was a lot, what we spent a lot of our time doing, and what I'll cover pretty deeply in the next, in sort of the, the sort of last half of this presentation. And so let's get into the half. What exactly we did to kind of build this gameplay. So we came back from San Francisco, the entire team was taken to San Francisco for six weeks after the acquisition, and that's where we pitched Adventure World and got a green lit. We came back and we said, all right, we need to do a first deliverable. We want to really impress these guys. Let's move quickly. Let's get something built. Our biggest concern was how do we make on-map gameplay fun? So we decided to do three maps that are not the tutorial, because as I'll get into, into this later, the first time user experience, especially for a free-to-play game, is incredibly, incredibly difficult to make, um, and it's the most important part, and it takes a long time. So we decided, let's not do the tutorial, let's instead just explore on-map gameplay and really focus on finding the fun. So let's iterate quickly, let's build prototypes, and let's just start throwing things out that don't work. Um, and we ended up getting three different prototypes that we were kind of excited about. And I'll talk to you guys about that different gameplay because you'll see that almost none of it actually made it into the game in the end, and that's important to, to look at. So the first thing we looked at was bush mazes. The second one was this sort of minesweeper. And then the last one was this memory puzzle, which was the only one of these three that really made it into the game in earnest. And again, we really wanted to find the fun. Um, it was really important to us to, to make this really fun so that when we showed this, to Zynga about six weeks after we got back that they would be so excited about this game that they were ready to ship it almost immediately. So we started with the Bushmates. So this right here is some of the original art from the very first prototype. Um, and you can see that it obviously changed a lot from what you saw in that, in that video. And you'll see more of this kind of evolve over time. But basically the idea here is, like I said before, you want to navigate this in the least amount of energy. So you want to get from point A to point B and there's a maze here. These paths create a maze underneath these bushes. So along the way, you can stop and get the treasure if you want. But again, watch out, because there's that's a spider, uh, and you'll have to fight him. Um, and so what we ended up doing was making it so that you would follow a path. And along the way, if you decided to make a wrong choice, so as you clear out the path, if you made a wrong choice, like clear this bush, because this, this path goes, um, goes up down this way, uh, you would end up getting into the thorns. And now thorns take more energy to clear, so if you really wanted to cut through that way, um, it would cost you even more. But you could do it. So that was the first sort of idea of gameplay. Very simple, you just like, you're clearing and, and understanding a maze. Where we initially started talking about the gameplay we wanted to put into in Adventure World to try it was, how can we take really approachable activities and bring them into the digital space? So we, we said, you know, what would you see on the back of a cereal box? Is there anything there? And one of the things was like, what about navigating a maze? Like, can we make that fun if we add in the idea that you're trying to navigate the maze in the least amount of energy? So we had my, my, um, uh, Metal Detector Minesweeper. And the idea here was all of these rocks, there were certain rocks that would drop gold. And you needed to collect gold to give to this blacksmith and she'd make you a key. And so if you put down your Metal Detector, which is one of the tools that we talked about, that, that I mentioned earlier, that you could potentially choose to, to kind of level up in an RPG fashion, you could actually use that to scan a grid. And you'd scan that area and it would say, hey, there's two gold nearby. And that way you'd have a better understanding of which rocks you should actually spend your energy on to clear and get the gold. We never ended up putting this into the game. Um, and it just, whenever we tried it, it, people just did not understand how to do it. The last one was a memory puzzle. And so I've talked about this a little bit, but you basically hit the switch and this pattern appears. And then you clear them in the order that you need to. And what that does is it would lower the um, it would lower the pedestal here and you'd be able to grab the item. And this is one of the things that did make it into the game. Um, 
and, and I showed you an example earlier. And this is one of the one of the puzzles that people really understood, and, and one of the things that we used a lot. So those were the three um, pieces of gameplay we built, and we were really excited about them. We were like, "Hey, these are fun. These are great. Um, users are going to love these things." We didn't have any users to test yet. We actually didn't start user testing until we sort of got into the first-time user experience, and I'll be talking about that a lot. Um, but now we were like, "Hey, now that we have this stuff." Let's try to figure out how to teach it, because that's what a first-time user experience is all about. And all these people have never played a game like this before. They've never played Ocarina of Time. They've never even picked up a controller, so they have no idea what an action adventure is. So how can we possibly talk them into playing? So we were like, all right, what are our goals for the first-time user experience? We want to teach the players about the game. So we have a lot of teaching to do, especially with the camera. The camera will become, I'll talk about this a lot, um, the camera was one of our biggest challenges, and if you if you if you've read a lot of postmortems of games, it's a challenge for most games um, to get the camera right. The other thing we wanted to do was talk about the core loop, making sure that people understood that things like tools and you know you got coins from clearing bushes and you use those coins to upgrade your tools, and how that whole thing worked was really clear. We wanted to make sure we explained the energy management, make sure that people understood how that worked, and then we wanted to make sure that, you know people had an idea of. of how to solve the puzzles. If we gave them puzzles that they would get it. If they had to navigate the bush maze, that they understood that, and that they thought it was fun. And the last thing was to give them a little bit of story. We thought it was really important to kind of make that promise early and say, hey, we're gonna give you guys great story all the time. Come back every week and play. So we started with the dig site. This, is, this, was, the, uh, um, this was the very first first time user experience that we built. Uh, and so you can see we have, you know, our, we have a, uh, new character in here. This was supposed to add part of the story. Um, I'm not sure how the plane got here. The runway is a little short, but you know, we 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 gave this a shot. And we put this in front of real users. And what we do is, you'd start here. You'd navigate this little bush maze because we really like that piece of gameplay. We thought that was great. Um, and we made it super simple. It's basically just like a straight line with like one turn in it to really try and teach that early. And then you come over here and you would put down some survey flags because we're like, hey, you know, this is. This is your you know, dig site, you know, your archaeology, so let's focus on that. And then you use the survey tool and you go down to a cave. You navigate another maze, because we did like mazes. You jump on these buttons, and then you get the item. That was it, first time user experience. It took about five minutes for us to play. Um, and we decided to put it in front of some users and see what they thought. Turns out they did not get it at all. Um, and it really uh, was shocking to us, um, and it's this is one of the things that that I that I tell students and I tell um, game developers all the time that are that are just starting out is you have to really really learn to love playtesting. It's gonna hurt to like sit in a room and watch your players struggle through your game and get frustrated and angry and they feel like they're dumb because they can't figure out your game, but it turns out you just give them bad controls and you have to get used to that and you have to realize that it's gonna be painful and tough, but it's really valuable to do it. Um, so, what we ended up doing was, you know, on the second pass, we decided we're going we're to scrap this thing. We're going to try to make it way simpler and teach just tools. We're going to try to make the energy management much more clear and make sure that it's fun because no one got the bush maze initially and they're like, I don't get this energy thing, you're not telling me what it is. I'm not running out of energy until I get to the end and then I didn't even understand why I was losing it. Um, we wanted to make the on-map gameplay even simpler. The like, survey flags, no one got that. No one understood what you needed to do there or why I needed to place them. Turns out not a lot of people have been to an archeological dig site, so they had no clue what we were talking about. And then we tried to make less story. The story was too overwhelming early on. You had all these characters popping up and no one, no one really knew who they were or cared about them. And it just was not that effective. Basically, we tried to simplify everything. So that's what I'm gonna talk about for, the, for basically the rest of this talk, is the evolution of this first map. What happened to that dig site and how did it turn into the first map that ends up in the game? Um, and so the first map of the game we ended up changing to be called the Jungle Path. Uh, there's 30 major lessons here that I'm gonna walk through of like all the sort of things that, that I learned personally. This, was, this map was assigned to me. We did one major reboot where I'll stop when we, when we get to it and it'll be really clear, but we basically scrapped the entire level one other time. Um, the rest of this is mostly just iteration. And then when I went back to do this talk, I, I had gone through our, our version control system and, and looked at the total number of changes checked in for this map, and there were 612 of them. So that shows you how much you know, iteration went into just the first map of the game, and we did this for a lot of maps. Um, and so it kind of will, will give you an idea of, of exactly how much work this was. This took place over a course of about nine months. 
Gonzinga does this really great thing where they bring you um, users all the time to test the game. And, and we basically did this every four to six weeks for the entirety of the development. So we were iterating on this stuff all the time. So this is where we started when we had the initial dig site. Um, like I said, it had a lot of shortcomings. So we did our first major reboot and we said, hey, we're gonna scrap all that, we're gonna make it way simpler, we're gonna reduce all this stuff, we're gonna teach tools. So let's start with the jungle path. So this was the new first level. So to walk you quickly through what you did here, you started, you grabbed the machete. Hey, we had to teach people about tools because you weren't grabbing tools before, we just stuck them in your inventory. And it turns out that everyone didn't understand that. They didn't understand why they already had tools and they assumed they had them. Then we had this uh, really simple gameplay of you had to get the pieces of the key to unlock the door. We thought that was, more, that was way simpler than, than trying to understand the survey flag and the survey tool. So you get these keys, despite the fact that they look like pizza, Slices because they're circular, and you put them in the in the mouth of the uh, of the door here, and it opens. Um, and so, when you open the door, you would go onto that level that I showed you before, and down through it, and and you would get to the end of the of the first time user experience. And these first two levels are basically the entire first time user experience. But after that point, you'd end up on the base camp, and you'd start the game for real. So, let's start talking through the changes. One of the things that you'll notice here's the very first iteration. Um, a couple of like quick changes here is that we added in uh, these jade bases. We put them all over the map. Um, and you guys saw them in some of the other screenshots. And the reason why we put them in here is players wanted rewards for, for doing exploring. They wouldn't just go and clear stuff if we didn't put anything there. And it turns out that this is like a pretty um, common thing in games. And this is, I'll, I'll put up a lot of these screenshots during the time of things that we should have known from games that had been out there that we just didn't know. Um, it turns out that you know there's a reason why they, why you know Mario puts puts these um, question mark boxes all over the place to get you to go after them because it's fun to try and go explore and find these things. And how many people cleared every bush in Ocarina of Time to get the rupees even when their purse was full, right? It's one of those things that gamers just love to do. And so that was something that we we thought was really important to add in, um, is to give people rewards and, and to make sure that there's an incentive and a reason to go explore. Another change was. We wanted to, there's a very small, small change here, um, is that this, uh, this key fragment in particular used to be sitting on dirt, like the other dirt around it. It turns out that people missed it when it was on the dirt, but by changing this tile to just be sand, we were able to, people were able to pick it up almost immediately and find it. Um, and this was one of the things that, we, that, that I learned early on was, hey, um, you should establish a relationship. All the other key fragments are sitting on sand. So you should be consistent as much as possible. And the last one was to teach everything again. One of the other things we added in was, hey, people um, picked up the machete the first time, now they needed to learn to pick up the whip. And so we, we started to teach people things multiple times in a row to try and get them to, to pick it up and understand it during the tutorial. So this is the second iteration. One of the things you'll notice here is that there's a lot of art changes. I'm not always going to call them out, but this will change drastically over time. Um, and, and basically, a lot of the things, you know, we had a lot of pieces of art that got smaller. We had certain um, bushes and things like that that just changed in terms of like their coloration. And obviously, the door changed. So the other thing that we got rid of here was there used to be a bush right up at the top of the staircase. And what it would do is it would cause people to not be able to path up here. So they would get down to this, uh, to this part of the map and they would have to get the last key fragment and they would find it and they would click on it. And their character would, would, wouldn't move and it'd be like, no path found. And users did not know what to do. They didn't understand that they had to go follow the path with their eyes and find the bush there and clear it and then go. And so what we did is we just removed it. And it turns out you don't need to teach everything. So we didn't need to teach how to not get through a path in the very first level. It turns out that that's not fun when a, when a user has to learn that, that's not something fun and interesting. They don't want to know that. You should make it easy on them initially, and then only bring that up much later on. So then, for this iteration, you'll notice that we put in a whole bunch of rocks. We got rid of over half of the bushes. And the reason why is because people would go through, just like they did in Zelda, and clear every single bush. But it took a really long time, and it ate up all their energy, and then they were sad when they were out of energy, and they couldn't get through the rest of the level. And it just wasn't satisfying. So what we did is we ended up just removing them and putting rocks in. And so 
every action, make every action satisfying and interesting, or just get rid of it. So we made it so the rocks were, were not even interactable. You would just clear only the bushes. And so, just like I said in, in Ocarina of Time, um, they, they make it interesting because they change up you know, the, way, the way Zelda moves and the animations that he makes, and they make it fun and cool for you to clear everything. We didn't have that. So now, the iteration here, the sort of change is that we decided to move the, uh, the um, character uh, here back out of the screen. So the camera would only see about this much. Um, this, was, this is obviously way zoomed out. Uh, and the reason why we did that is because we need to focus players on a single goal. Um, and for anyone that, that's taken level design, I talk about this a lot in the fact that you really need to be focused on a single goal going through a level. Um, because players would get really confused because they would see this key fragment that they knew they had to get, but there was this character standing there and he was animating and kind of like, you know, hanging out there and everyone tried to go talk to the character. And that was not what we wanted. We wanted to have them go get the key fragment first. So we just pulled the character out of the frame. Um, and the other thing we did is we removed a bunch of the stuff that would have potentially been interesting um, that would distract from where they were going. So this was, there was a jade vase right here and we pulled that out because we wanted users to just go for the key fragment. So anything that was in that frame of the camera that wasn't that key fragment and wasn't a bush, we just removed. So then, this is, this is one of my favorite ones. Um, this, this sort of area back here is the part that kind of changed in this iteration. Um, this to us looks like typical isometric, like, yeah, you can totally climb those stairs. It turns out to, to a lot of people that have never played these games before and don't have our sort of shared knowledge of games, um, it was not that easy. They did not understand that, that you could actually go back here and get this key fragment. And they would be wondering, like, I don't know how to get up there. And so what we did is, um, I asked the art team to make us stairs, and they did. Um, and it turns out, if you want people to use your stairs, you should make them look like stairs. And that was, that was a very tough, uh, tough lesson for us to learn. Um, and and it, was, it seems so silly now, but it actually took like numerous iteration, um, iterations to actually get to that point. Uh, and it was something that, you know, I can't, I can't tell you how valuable that is. The more real world connections you can use, the less you need to teach, and the easier it becomes. So the other thing we did is we made everything shorter. You can tell that the whole level got scrunched in during this iteration because it just was too much stuff. We wanted to make it tighter and, and, um, and let the player play through it faster and have it be less stuff um, to, to explore and to kind of slow them down. So this one, uh, we took our little character here on this iteration and we moved him. He's now, we put him in 3D at this point because he was done being a concept character. Um, so he's this little triangle down here because um, we didn't show 3D characters in the editor. This is like what a screenshot looks like from the editor. Uh, and this was, a, this was sort of an important one. We would, we would land you after the plane, and the very first thing that would happen is this character would like, his little like, text bubble would pop in and he had his face. He was like, hey, I'm Professor Allen, like, welcome to the jungle. And it turns out that there were numerous people that did not, they were like, who is this person? Is this, is this me, am I that guy? I don't like that guy. And so what we did is we, we made him so that he was there. So he was standing there when you came in, and it turns out that if you introduce a character, people are way more comfortable with that. As soon as we moved him up to the front, there were no questions around whether or not the, the player was that character. Everyone knew who he was. So this is, this is um, one of my favorite really subtle ones, and one of the sort of pet peeves about the camera. So there's these two bushes right here, and they just moved one square, that's it. This is probably like a, a, a week of time in between these two. And what was happening was the, uh, the camera would be just out of frame so that you couldn't see this bush. So the players would not know where to go. They would clear this first bush and then stop because they couldn't find the next thing to click on. And it turns out that the idea of like clicking on an empty space was not that apparent to a lot of people. They like wanted to click on bushes or or you know, spiders, or characters, or bases, or whatever, they didn't want to just click on empty space to walk there. And so what we ended up doing was just pulling that bush in so you could see it at the end of the camera angle, and as soon as you walked up there, the camera would shift. So the default camera zoom matters a lot. And make sure that you're playing at that level. I can't tell you how many of the designers were playing their levels that fully zoomed out, and then were very, very shocked at how people would actually play their levels when they're at the normal default camera zoom. I can't tell you how important that is. Play your game at where you expect your players to play it. So, 
this uh, this sort of last bit of our of our trying to keep the maze game plan that I told you we loved so much when we were initially talking about this was, was like these couple of bushes right here. We were like, hey, we're still going to be able to teach this. Don't worry, it'll be fun. I swear, we'll get it there. Um, and it wasn't. So if it turns out if you can't teach it, just cut it. Just get rid of it. Um, and maybe you'll throw it in later. Maybe not. You have to be able to just make a decision to stop working on it and realize that it's just not going to work. Um, and it's hard to do. It's hard to throw that out because we spent a long time trying to make that gameplay fun, and it just didn't work. We never ended up using it. Um, here's another. Here's a little bit of an interesting thing around around the art. It's something that I think is really important when you're. One of the other reasons why you should really play test your games with real users. This. Uh, the change here is, is this particular piece of this foreground object showing up over, over this straight piece. So it turns out that users were seeing this like straight line edge, and they would like stop and, and be like, oh, is this, is this like something wrong with the screen? Is this an error? Is this like screen tearing? And the first user that did it, I was like, whatever, like that, that's not. And then like two other people did it, and that was enough for us to just be like, hey, let's fix this. And so we just ended up fixing it. And it turns out that by doing that, and by like breaking up these lines a little bit, um, we didn't break the immersion for anyone. People just started to go through it. And this is why it's really important to get people to play your game that have never seen it before. They find these little, these little problems and they let you fix them. Um, so here's a, this change was pretty drastic. One of the things we were trying to do here is that the, the, the idea of the energy-based gameplay was not sinking in. So we started to use these thorns. So you see these thorns that we kind of put in in all these different places. Um, and the reason why we put them in is it turns out that People don't like thorns. They're like, you know, just from their everyday lives realize they should probably avoid them. And so they did here. And so what we did is we made those thorns way more energy and we made the bushes way less. And it caused people to like get through the bushes and they would start to understand what was going on with the energy-based gameplay. Um, and it let us do things like, oh hey, the easy way to get to this particular key fragment is to go through this bush or this, uh, this set of thorns. But these thorns were like eight energy and each of these bushes was only one. So it'd be easier to go around. And so that was like one of our very first points around the energy mechanic. And so you should use stereotypes as teaching tools. This is very similar to what I talked about with the sort of staircase, but it's a little bit different whenever you're trying to use it as, as it ties into thematically a mechanic in your game. So this was the very first point of one of the things we were, we were so afraid of. We were like, oh my God, we're trying to make game, games for like our parents and for people that never played games before. They don't want excitement. They don't want, you know, like rolling boulders. They don't want any of that. They want something calm and pretty and a place to escape and like relax. That's not true. That was something that we, we fabricated that in our brains and we held onto it for way too long. Um, and so what we ended up doing kind of like on a whim was putting in a trap. So this is like a spike trap with, you know, this with this sort of face is, is very similar to, to what's in the kind of beginning of of Raiders of the Lost Ark. If anyone's seen that movie several times, you'll, you'll recognize it. Uh, the idea here was you'd walk up to that trap and the spikes would come up and you'd have to clear them. Um, and people loved this. Like the first time we put it in front of users, they were so excited that was their most memorable moment of the whole time they were playing the game. And it turns out that we were just completely wrong about this danger thing. Um, people want the surprise. They want the danger. They want this, this interesting aspect of it. It turns out that you know that type of flavor is not going to turn anyone off. So, uh, how many people, how many game design students have heard of the rule of three before? Anybody? So if you haven't read the sort of um, uh, articles on it, you should check it out because like seriously use the rule of three. So I removed one of the, one of the key fragments here because we just didn't need it. Um, I had four and it was just too much and sort of the idea of, of paring back and making the whole level as small and as tight as possible um, and as interesting and condensed as it could be, I just got rid of one of them. And so, always use the rule of three. So, uh, this was when we hey, we said, hey, these traps are really working great. Um, we should use them all over the place. And so, the idea behind this was, if we just did it once, it was sort of an outlier. It was this unique thing that only happened once. And that does not do, um, that, that does not do justice to the mechanic that you're building because it won't, it won't be consistently in your world. Players will just think it's a one-off thing. You want to try to establish these relationships and get players to understand what they have going on. And so don't orphan your mechanics. So you can see that I put kind of spike traps all over the place here. Um, 
And, and the idea was to try and get them so that there wasn't just this one spot it was happening, but that it was happening all over. One of the sad things here, though, um, is that, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, is that all these traps act differently, which sort of goes against the thing I said before about, you know, everything should be consistent. And I, don't worry, I end up fixing it later. But at this iteration, I did not fix it. This is one of those things when you go back and look at this, and I was like, what was I thinking? Like, I should have known that. But I didn't learn that until, like, four more iterations. Um, the other thing was making the path to the objects really clear. So you can see that I ended up using this path that we were going to use for the mazes to, um, to bring people, bring players like through the map. For anyone that's taken my level design class, this is part of wayfinding and indirect control. Um, and if you're interested on that topic more, you should check out either this book um, by Jesse Schell, which he talks a lot about indirect control, or you can find one of his papers online about it. Or this book, which unfortunately is out of print, which is just all around wayfinding and how to like build architectural things to, um, to sort of guide users. This, is, this book goes into like how you can navigate an airport even though you can't read a word of Japanese. Um, and, it's, and it's really good. Um, and that's, that's my only plug for that type of stuff. But this was a very heavily level design oriented one. Um, the last one is to set players up to be smart. So one of the things we did here was we put this trap um, on the path. We made it very clear, like, hey, go through this trap, user. Go through this trap, you dumb user. Do it. After we'd already like had them go through this trap, so hopefully they'd learn their lesson. Um, and what we did is we actually made this other path here, where they could go around these bushes and still get to this by avoiding the trap. Um, and the idea was, how can we set up the user to feel smart, to feel like they out they outsmarted the game, they outsmarted the, the level? And the idea is to just like make it obvious, like point it out. So that's what we did is by, by creating this sort of secondary path. We ended up like laying this on way way more when we when we started to get later on this level. And I'll talk a little bit about how we, how we set that up. Um, but again, like I said, every trap acts differently here, which was sort of a no-no and made me really sad. But I'll fix it in like two iterations. So um, this was a, so this is a very, this is hard to see on, on this particular version, but there's these little circles that are now in between the traps. Um, uh, at this point, uh, this was when we added in damage. So those little guys there are like these hot spots that do damage to the player. Uh, this is obviously in the editor. Um, they don't look like this in the game. Uh, but the reality was that you know the surprise and the like danger wasn't enough. We like had to make consequences. So it turns out that like players wanted that. We were so afraid of this. We're like they're going to see this. They're going to lose. They're going to lose. They're going to take damage, and it's going to be. They're going to hit the back button, and we're never going to see them again. Because that's always that was always a concern. Is the fact that like oh in, in games like Farmville and Frontierville there's no negative consequences to anything. Um, we were one of the first single games to do it, and so um, this like permanent negative consequence. And so we were like okay, um, this won't work. We put this in. No one had any problem with it. They were like yeah I get it. I took damage. I just stepped in a trap. It's fine. And we were just like shocked at that. It turns out that that people understand a little bit more than you think. We we tried to name like all of the. All the you know the whip and the machete and the pickaxes like tools, but there were like a large number of people that still called them weapons anyway, even though we still try to call them tools. So people like understood the way the games worked. So here we go. This was the major reboot. So after working on this, and don't worry, guys, we're almost done. We have basically this idea that players want one decision and one goal at a time. I talked about this before, but like when you look at that blobby map. Um, it it uh it would have been really hard. You have to like we had to segment it out using specific camera frames to actually make that work. And so during this time, we sort of thought really hard about ways to make that better. We were still struggling with the camera. We couldn't figure out the best way to use it. And so what we did is we we ended up taking a look at some of the games that I mentioned before. And it turns out that when you look at the dungeon design from specific games, even going all the way back to Legend of Zelda, but even looking at World of Warcraft, they're room based. They do everything based on a room. And the reason why is there's usually a single objective in that room, sometimes it's to find the exit, but there's usually a single objective in that room that you work towards. And you find the way through to that objective and then you finish it. It makes it really clear and really easy to understand. So that's what we ended up doing, is we broke this level out, so each one of these has a single key fragment on it, and that's, that's the way we move through making the level. Um, and so we broke these up into rooms, um, just like you would, you would expect in, any, in, a, in a dungeon in Zelda. Um, it took us a while to really iterate and get to this, um, and I, it completely changed the game. It made the game way easier to understand, it made it way more fun, and it made it way easier to build levels. 
So this just shows you kind of all of it. I can't fit all of it on the screen. Um, but again, really small runway for this plane. I don't know how it got there. But this is sort of where you start and you move through these levels to get to the end. You can see that our door is still there. So one of the other things that we wanted to do here that I learned was, was really valuable is to, is to actually like give players a break. So anyone that's played a lot of you know, recent shooters, you'll realize that they do this. If you really pay attention, they'll give you a break in between really high uh, intensity battles. Here's a war that's like, pretty famous for this, where they just like have downtime like on purpose. You're like running to the next spot to like do the next encounter. And a lot of modern shooters sort of capitalize on this. And the idea is to just like give you a break. And what the reason why they do that is to like really tell you when, they're, when you're done. Hey, you did a good job. Take a break. Now you're ready for the next thing. And it gives this great ebb and flow to your game that makes, that makes the intensity stay right exactly in kind of like the sweet spot. Um, the other thing is mechanics need to be consistent. Hey, look, I put um, the, this sort of uh, face was, was a disarm for, the, for those spike traps that I showed you before. And I put them in, and I made all the spike traps the same. So I finally learned my own lesson that I needed to do that. Um, it took a couple iterations, but I made it. Uh, and so the other thing that we did is, so um, this was sort of the first iteration of the, of the new way. Um, so the second iteration was this. And so this was, if you'll remember, one of the lessons that I had learned the first time that I guess I didn't really learn, and I needed to make everything short. So I cut out an entire room, just removed it entirely, uh, because we didn't need it. It turned out that like it wasn't really giving us anything, it wasn't helping move the gameplay along, it wasn't teaching anything, it just wasn't, wasn't worth it. The other thing is, make a single objective fit into a single screen. So it turns out that like doing the rooms wasn't enough. We really needed to make this work on a single screen in order for the camera to work for the way we wanted it to. So I made the rooms all small enough that they would fit just in a single camera screen, so it was really clear like what objective you needed to go after. The other thing we did here is we started to get into this, this structure of teaching mechanics like we're teaching vocab words. So we would introduce the mechanic. So here, we're introducing spike traps. And we're not even giving you a chance. We're assuming that everyone's going to click on this key fragment because it had a big yellow arrow on it. Um, and they're going to go through the trap and they're going to get stuck. And they're going to learn, like, hey, I can take damage from these traps. I know what these are. Then we would define this, this gameplay for the player. And so what would happen is, as they came down here, we would put a big, giant arrow on the disarm button for the trap. And we teach them, like, this is how you disarm a trap. Like, you've been introduced to what a trap is. This is how you disarm it, and then we gave him a challenge. And so what we do is we, we had the path go straight through the trap if you wanted to, to, uh, to get to the key fragment, but we also like laid a path to go around to the disarm. And we did this camera move when you got up to the top that sort of did a camera move far here, paused for a second, and then centered on the, on, the, um, on the key that you needed to get. And what that did is give us an opportunity to sort of challenge the player and make him feel smart. And we got into the structure for every new mechanic that we came upon, like whether it be combat or puzzles or whatever, and we sort of started to build this structure of introducing it, and it worked out really well for us. <coughs> so this is just explaining the breakdown there. So the difference between these two is that in this first one, um, you can see that the key fragment is down here, um, and, and you couldn't see it. So what we ended up doing is moving it. So you could see it in the frame. This was another camera one. Um, you want to always be clear with your objective and make sure that the players can see it. Um, it's really important, especially early on in your game, to make sure that players know how to get to where they need to go and they know how to, they know how to achieve the objective that you give them. So this was a, mostly an art one, but during this time you can see that there's been some iteration in the art throughout these sets of maps, but um, when, we, when we put this in front of users, uh, a lot of them didn't really get it. They were like, wait, I don't understand that. It doesn't look like I'm in a jungle, this looks like I'm in a field. Um, and so we needed to really establish a sense of place. And it was, it was important to us that we, you know, we wanted to make it so you were traveling to these new areas and experiencing this new stuff. So we needed to establish a sense of place. And so we worked with the art team to get this foreground and background object situation and, and solution that would make it feel good and make it work well. We actually had like parallax scrolling so you could you would have things um, scroll at different distances and sort of really give it a sense of like being in a world. Um, so this, this particular change is mostly focused up here. So we did this thing where you would have a, a character, another explorer, like yourself, start up here, and then foolishly be like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm going to go get the Aztec's key, and he would fall down a hole right here. Um, and 
what we did is we made that, if you, if you had a friend invite you to the game, um, like if Mark invited me to come play this game, his picture would appear over that character. Um, and then we would, we would say like, hey, or we'd use Mark's avatar. Um, and so and, uh, what we ended up doing was making it personal. And it turns out that like the feedback on this was great. People loved this. Uh, it's one of the things that, that really works well for social games. And if you have the opportunity to do it, you should. Um, you should take advantage of that. If you, know, if you know people have friends that play the game, like tell them that their friends are playing the game. Um, it'll make them want to keep playing. Uh, this was one of the things that, uh, this looks like a big change with all the art, but that's not the sort of main part of this one. One of the things that, that we sort of took out in this next step was any time that there was double um, bushes, we removed them. So we made it so that you weren't repeating the same thing over and over again, because clearing a bush and then immediately turning a corner one step away and clearing another bush was just boring. So we removed them. Anywhere you did it twice. Um, and so you can see that we went from way back in the beginning having bushes kind of everywhere as the only object to making it so that they were few and far between. So that it was like interesting every time you did it. So this uh, particular one, you can see that we added a bunch of spike traps here. Uh, and the reason why is we, we had the idea of, of these skills. And you had the skill to like clear as many things as you could in a certain amount of time for no energy. And we needed to have a great example for that in order to tell players where to use it, like where to use this power up. And so that's what this was. And it's really important to like give a good example of where you expect the player to use something the first time if you want them to continue to use it over the long term. Um, so the, the sort of last one here, uh, this is about being consistent. This is a very small change. You guys probably can't see it on there, but basically the bushes that are here have white flowers on them. So later on in the game, we started to use these white flower bushes. If you clear them, they have like a, secret, um, uh, a secret room underneath them, um, just like Ocarina of Time, and you'd be able to go down and like find extra treasure. And it turns out that we, when people would find these on the map and they didn't have them, uh, underneath, they would be really upset. And they're like, oh, I thought that that was like a thing that you guys were, were telling me that, you know, if I went under, if I cleared a white flower bush, like there'd be a secret there. Um, so we, we were consistent. We went in and we changed that. The other thing you can obviously tell is that we changed a lot of the art here um, to a completely different color palette. Um, and so one of the, the sort of last thing here is uh, um, we put in this, uh, this whole ground layer. We got rid of all of the tiles. You can see that all the sort of tiles are gone. And the reason why is um, our players like did not have the same sense of nostalgia for this isometric tile-based grid. And they wanted to see like more of like a painterly world. And so we ended up doing like hand-painted backgrounds. Um, and that's what all these blue tiles end up going transparent when you bring them into the real game. And so it was this hand-painted background with sort of these like sections of raised um, ground that we tried to not make look as much like tiles. We tried to like round the edges and make them feel much more like real rock formations. Um, and that was, that was sort of the final bit, which was to really like make the world feel full. And that's the last one. And so um, the last bit here <coughs> is to kind of show you, this is where the game ended up. So this is what the, in the game, in the actual engine, this is what the first level looked like. You can see that one of my friends is down here, like that's his picture, and I'm gonna save him once he falls through this thing. That's where it started. So you can see that there's a pretty big difference between this and where we ended up. Um, and so here are the 30 lessons um, all put together. So if you ever give a talk at GDC, you should have one of these slides. This is sort of the, everyone pulls out their camera and takes a picture of the slide. Um, make sure you have one of these. Uh, and so just to kind of cover, um, you know, wrap, wrap things up here is the, the reality is we iterate on everything like this. Unfortunately, I would be talking all day if I talked through all the ways we did this, but if you look at that second level, so when you went down that door, what did you see? This is where we started. This is where that level ended up. So you can see the amount of like iteration and change there. Um, and we did this for everything, uh, whether it be combat, whether it be you know puzzles. We spent so much time as a design team just iterating on what were the puzzles we used on the levels. Were they fun enough? How did they work together? How did they link together? How did the story work with the quests? And we did this amount of iteration for all of them. So that was the how. So one of the big takeaways, the sort of post-mortem uh, takeaways, is the what went right for us. We let ourselves wander. We sort of like <coughs> knew that we were trying to build something completely different. We were trying to do this on-map gameplay, and it was going to be hard, and it wasn't going to, it wasn't going to, we weren't sure it was going to work. Um, and that was really important. 
Uh, we question our sacred cows. This was um, one of the things we talked about all the time was these ideas of, of sacred cows, which are things like the, you know, don't do damage to players. Um, we questioned those because we wrote those down on paper and we didn't put them in front of real users. When we made them in the game, we really started to question them. And it's important to do that sometimes because a lot can change over the course of your game. Um, we prototyped everything, like I showed up there, like we prototyped everything we put in. We didn't just decide on paper and build it. We like built the prototypes and played it and made sure it was fun um, before, we, before we moved on. And the last thing is we focused on iteration. Uh, we really just iterated on everything to try and make it work. So what did we learn? So this is the, this is the PR version of what went wrong. Um, so what we learned is don't innovate everywhere. We tried to innovate on everything in this game because we're like, we're better than Zynga. We're going to do everything better from the quest log to the gameplay. It turns out that their quest log is probably fine and you should put your energy somewhere else. Um, really focus on the couple of things that you want to innovate on and nail those. Because if you try to spread around your innovation, it's going to make everything else more watered down. Polish an aspect of design uh, to done early. This is a sort of really interesting um, piece that, that we never actually did all the way through, but that is, is a popular idea in game design. If you take a specific object and you make it finish, like one level all the way to being completely done, and you say that every other level is going to be measured by this. We didn't have a time to do that because we were too busy like trying to put out every fire because we were innovating on everything. Um, and it was something that I really wish we would have done because I think it would have made the overall quality way better. Don't lose your vision in the feedback. This is sort of the very last one. Um, <coughs> We got a lot of feedback, whether from users, from user testing, from big group user testing, from the executives inside the company, to all sorts of things. And it ended up being overloaded. We would get so much feedback that we didn't know what to do. And we were making these snap judgments of like, oh, well, you know, we heard that we should fix this, so we should go do that right now. We started to like make a, you know, we had to make a conscious effort to, to not immediately change things based on feedback and to like let ourselves think about it and think it through and make sure it's the right decision. So a lot of people ask me, you know, was it worth it? Like, do I think it was worth all the time and effort? And I, and I think it was. And so, you know, a couple of the a couple of quotes that I pulled out of the forums when I was doing this was, um, you know, about things like the little surprises, about the puzzles that we put in, um, uh, which was which was really awesome to hear because we worked really hard at that. Um, this one was great. Like, it talks about you know something that we we put in that we didn't teach. We like made it so that you could pull a pull one of the bad guys, like a spider or a snake, into a trap and then kill them. Um, and you wouldn't take any energy. And users figured that out, and they thought it was awesome, and they thought it was really fun. And it was something that was so satisfying to us, because it was something that we thought would be really cool, but we didn't want to try and teach it, because it was kind of complicated and hard to do. And users found that, and they loved it. Then the very last one was just like talking about basically our, our overall like push for quality, which was something that the Boston Studio did um, very, very well. We, we only wanted to release quality stuff, like quality in art, quality in sound, quality in gameplay. Um, and it's something that we, we sort of took a lot of pride in. Um, so that's basically it. I'm just about out of time, but um, you know, my email's up there. If you have any questions about this, um, it's be available. I wrote a postmortem specifically in Game Developer Magazine in May. Um, for anyone that's interested in sort of hearing more about this, there's probably copies of it available somewhere. Um, and if you really care to follow me on Twitter, it's up there. It's sort of a requirement to have that from BBC. Um, so that's basically it. Do you guys have any questions? Well, thank you very much, Brian and Mark. I appreciate it.